Hello, and welcome to part two of our lecture series on the immune system. And in part two, we're going to look at the encapsulated organs associated with the immune system. And the first of these encapsulated organs are going to be the lymph nodes. And so what we're going to be looking at, uh, the lymph nodes are going to be relatively small, oval, or maybe kidney bean shaped uh, encapsulated structure. And so they're going to have a distinct anatomical structure. They're going to have a connective tissue boundary around the outside, and they're going to have a distinct uh, appearance when we take a look at it. This distinct anatomical appearance will also correspond to the, the physiological properties where we're going to be essentially using these lymph nodes as a filter. And so when we take a look at this, and again, take a look at the, the image on the right-hand portion of the slide, We've got structures that are going to be found as part of the lymphatic circulatory system. And so we're going to be collecting excess tissue fluid out in the periphery, and we're going to be returning that towards the heart. And it's going to be carried by these lymph vessels. And these lymph vessels are going to dump into a region of these lymph nodules. The afferent lymph vessels are going to dump into essentially that space at the top of this. The fluids and the things suspended within the fluids are going to filter through this structure and ultimately exit at the hilus, that kind of dimpled region of this kidney vein shaped structure, in the efferent lymphatic vessel down there at the bottom. And so doing this allows us then to filter the materials that are passing through the lymphatic circulatory system. We take a look at the overall structure associated with the lymph node. We're going to have a dense connective tissue capsule surrounding the entire organ, surrounding the entire structure. And then extensions of that dense connective tissue capsule are going to be trabeculi. They're going to extend down into the lymph node from the capsule. In between that, we're going to have a lot of reticular connective tissue. So reticular cells, reticular fibers. And again, if we think about that from our connective tissue lecture a while back, we're going to have like a jungle gym type structure, which is going to allow for a lot of open spaces for the cells to migrate through the region, as well as the, the lymph and the tissue fluids and the materials within it can percolate through this area relatively easily. If we take a look at the organization of the lymph node, uh, we're going to have the capsule around the outside, and then underneath that, we're going to have a cortex. And within the cortex, it's going to be very basophilic staining, because what we're going to have is going to be a very dense accumulation of those small lymphocytes that we've talked about previously. We're also going to find a lot of lymph nodules in this region, both primary and secondary lymph nodules. It's secondary lymph nodules, again, activating uh, regions of activated lymphocytes, so they have a germinal center. Now, in general, the cortex is going to be B lymphocyte territory because we're going to have these lymph nodules, which we know are going to be B lymphocytes, uh, the ones that are able to produce uh, antibodies. Deeper to the cortex is going to be the deep cortex or the paracortex. And this is going to be a more even staining appearance, still of small lymphocytes, so very basophilic staining, lots of small cells, but no lymph nodules. Again, the lymph nodules are going to be B lymphocytes, in this case in the deep cortex, no nodules, and we're going to have T lymphocytes uh, associated with the cell-mediated uh, immunity. And then deeper to that, we're going to have a more open staining region uh, a lighter appearance uh, because the cells are going to be scattered uh, away from one another and we're actually going to have medullary sinuses, so spaces in between medullary cords where the cells are going to be located. Now as we said, this is going to be important because the fluids, the tissue fluid is going to filter into uh, the, the lymph node. It's going to get dumped into the space underneath that capsule and then it's going to basically going to filter through the cortex through the deep cortex into the medulla where it's going to get into uh, the medullary sinuses and then the medullary sinuses are ultimately going to drain into that efferent lymphatic vessel, so draining it through. Along the way, it's going to take those materials that are suspended within the lymph and expose that to lots of these both B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes throughout the lymph node. Now the second structure, second encapsulated structure organ uh, that we're going to talk about within the immune system is going to be the thymus. And the thymus is going to be involved with the production of T lymphocytes. And so it's going to be involved primarily during early stages development. And what it's going to be doing is producing T lymphocytes, those cell-mediated immunity cells. Now it's going to be characterized by the fact that the thymus has no lymph nodules. 
Again, keep in mind that the lymph nodules, those circular aggregates of these small lymphocytes, are going to be associated with B cells, with thymus, because it's T cells exclusively, are going to have no of these lymph nodules. And so we're going to look at this. Uh, we're going to have these clusters of cells, which are going to be T lymphocytes, cell-mediated immunity cells, uh, going through the process of development. If we like to look at the overall structure of the thymus, again, it's going to have a cortex, or, I'm sorry, it's going to have a, a a capsule around the outside. It's going to be supported by, in this case, epithelial reticular cells. And so these are going to be specialized cells that instead of forming a connective tissue matrix are going to be forming this long kind of cytoplasmic process, stell HC. So they're going to form almost that jungle gym type structure, but instead of doing it with fibers, they're going to be doing it with cellular processes. Lots of desmosomes holding these epithelial reticular cells together because we don't want this, the structure to fall apart. Now, if we take a look at the overall organization of the thymus, we're going to have a cortex around the outside. The cortex is going to be uh, darker staining, again, very basophilic, because it's going to be packed with very small heterochromatic cells, lots of uh, dense nuclei, uh, inactive cells, so not a lot of cytoplasm. And it's going to look like an accumulation of lymphocytes in other regions of the body. But they're going to be packed very close to one another, giving it a very dark staining appearance. The medulla is going to be that central region where we're going to have larger lymphocytes. So again, the, the cells are going to have more cytoplasm associated with them, and it's going to dilute out the dark staining appearance. So it's going to be paler staining within the medulla. Um, still have T lymphocytes, uh, but we're also going to have this location where we're going to find kind of the cell bodies for the epithelial reticular cells that are providing the, the stroma or the, the, the structure throughout this organ. One of the identifying characteristics for the thymus is the presence of what are referred to as either thymic corpuscles or Hassel's corpuscles. And what these are is this kind of concentric structure of these thymic epithelial reticular cells and they essentially come together, they cluster together, and in many cases, uh, they may become keratinized. And you start to see these accumulate, uh, especially in uh, adult thymus and at later stages uh, of life. And so it may be kind of a, a less active form of these epithelial reticular cells. And then the final of the uh, organs associated with the immune system that we're going to talk about is going to be the spleen. And the spleen is going to be a little bit different than what we've talked about with the lymph node and with the thymus. The lymph node, I'm sorry, the spleen is going to have two functions. It's essentially going to have uh, an immune system function, and then it's also going to have a function associated with uh, the red blood cells of the cardiovascular circulatory system. And we'll talk a little bit about both of these. But basically, these two functions are going to be uh, delineated within different regions of the spleen. Now, the immune system function is going to be involved with what's referred to as white pulp. White pulp is the location where we're going to have the production of active lymphocytes. So, again, we're going to be presenting lymphocytes with materials, in this case, they're being transported by the bloodstream, and say, okay, is this something we need to mount an immune response to? And if it does, what we're going to be looking at is cells are going to be involved with antibody production. And that's all uh, occurring within the immune system portion of the spleen within the white pulp. The other portion of the spleen is going to be red pulp, and it's going to be red because it has lots of red blood cells that are going to be present. And in essence, what's going to happen with the red pulp is that we're essentially going to be looking at red blood cells and determining whether they're, they're good and functioning and pliable, flexible, or whether they're old, worn out, and potentially damaged. And so the red pulp is essentially going to be involved with uh, filtering out old red blood cells, non-functioning or less functioning red blood cells, and eliminating them from the body. Uh, they are also going to be a phagocytizing uh, particulate materials within the blood. And that's going to be the primary function associated with this uh, red pulp of the spleen. If we take a look at the white pulp of the spleen, again, what we're going to be looking at are going to be lymphatic tissues. So we're going to have lots of small lymphocytes that are going to be present. And as we've talked about before, when we have this accumulation of small lymphocytes, we're going to have a very basophilic staining appearance because we've got densely heterochromatic nuclei, the densely packed nuclei, and not a whole lot of cytoplasm present. If we take a look at the overall structure, what we're going to have is going to be a central artery, and that central artery is going to be a branch of the splenic artery, which is going to be bringing blood into 
the region of the white pulp. Now, immediately surrounding that splenic artery, in this case, um, the, the splenic artery, the central artery, uh, is going to be two on this diagram. Uh, we're going to have labeled three on this diagram is going to be the periarterial uh, lymphatic sheath. Now, the periarterial lymphatic sheath is going to be a collection of T lymphocytes. Again, T lymphocytes associated with the cell mediated immunity. And then ultimately, we're going to have these lymph nodules or splenic nodules, which are going to be surrounding that, uh, what we've got on area one on the diagram uh, to the right, are essentially going to be B cells. B cells uh, involved with the production of antibodies within the immune system. And again, what they're going to be doing is sampling the materials that are being transported within the central artery or transported without, within the bloodstream. Now, if we take a look again at the white pulp, what we're going to have are these lymph nodules, which are going to be accumulations of B lymphocytes, the cells involved with producing antibodies when they become activated, when they become stimulated by uh, an antigen that they can respond to. And so these lymph nodules are going to be surrounding the PAS, PALS, the periarterial lymphatic sheath, that region of T cells, which itself is surrounding that central artery. Now, within the spleen, uh, within the white pulp of the spleen, we're going to give the secondary lymph nodules a special name. Again, the secondary lymph nodules, we're going to have um, the darker region around the outside of small lymphocytes, and then we're going to have that central region where we're going to have that paler staining. Again, that paler staining is going to represent the cells that have become activated. So we're going to have a lot of plasma cells, cells that their, their DNA aren't as heterochromatic because they're actually going to be involved in the production of uh, antibodies. And so the secondary lymph nodules in the spleen, in the white pulp of the spleen, are often referred to as Malpighian corpuscles. But again, they're going to look similar to the secondary lymphatic nodules that we've seen in other regions of the body, but they're going to be identified by the fact that we've got this central artery, a branch of the splenic artery, that is going to be in that location, as well as they're going to be surrounded by the red pulp of the spleen. If we take a look at the red pulp of the spleen, what we're going to see is an area that is red because it's containing a large number of red blood cells. And so if we take a look at this, what we're going to see within the red pulp of the spleen are going to be a collection of either splenic cords or splenic sinuses. And so if we take a look at the cords, basically what we're going to have is going to be a meshwork of reticular cells and reticular fibers, as well as essentially a cellular location for lots of red blood cells, lots of macrophages, and lots of lymphocytes. So this is going to be the location of the cells. The splenic sinuses are going to be specialized sinusoidal vessels. And so they're essentially going to be uh, essentially spaces. And if we take a look at them, um, essentially what we're going to see is similar to other regions where we've had capillaries. These splenic sinuses are going to be lined by an endothelial cell, but instead of this continuous endothelial cell that we've seen previously forming a nice barrier, what we're going to have is a situation where these endothelial cells are essentially going to be forming a basal lamina that has rings rather than a continuous structure. And so we're going to have gaps in the endothelial lining of these splenic sinuses. And these gaps are going to be important because when we take a look at what's occurring within the red pulp of the spleen, we're essentially looking at a region where we've got an open circulatory system. Now we talked about a closed circulatory system with the cardiovascular system heart into the pumpy blood, into the arteries, through capillaries, back to the veins, and back to the heart again. Within the spleen, we're going to have an open circulatory system. We're going to be pumping blood into the spleen, but that blood cells are going to be dumped from the cardiovascular system vessels into the splenic cords, into the connective tissue space, into that cellular space. And they've got to squeeze into the splenic sinuses to get back into essentially the capillaries to be returned to the cardiovascular system and circulated through the body. In order to go from the splenic cords into the splenic sinuses, they've got to squeeze through those gaps. And the only way they can squeeze through those gaps is if they're good red blood cells that are relatively flexible. If they're old, if they're damaged, if they're not very flexible, they're going to be stuck within the splenic cords. And if they're stuck in the cords, they're going to be phagocytized by the macrophages within that region. This is going to finish up our lecture on the immune system. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.